gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let My name is James, uh, I'm one of the church leaders here, and we're starting a new series this Sunday. We are talking about praying. Try praying. You've seen a, a banner as you leave, there'll be a banner outside our uh, church building, and we've uh, been working and r- working our way through these booklets uh, this past week, and there are some more booklets that you can give out to your friends, families, people you've been praying for. Please do pick up your booklets. So there are three ways, three ways rather, that we can learn about praying. Uh, we learn by experience, we learn by explanation, and we learn by example. Without doubt, the easiest way to learn something is by example. So then you don't have to make all the mistakes yourself. So today we're going to learn from a good example, uh, the example of Hannah. The rest of the month, we're looking at other examples in the Bible. So Hannah is a good example of how God answers the prayers of people who feel hopeless. She is a good example of when times are hard, pray. Hannah, if you don't know her her story, if you start turning to uh, the first book of Samuel in your Bibles or on your phones, on your apps... It's that first chapter in the first book of Samuel. So all of her life, Hannah wanted to have a baby, but she was infertile. She couldn't have a child, so she turned to prayer. Let's turn to this first book of Samuel. There's a bit of a boom going on. Um, So uh, first book of Samuel, but this is the prayer of Hannah. So... um, Samuel is actually the son of Hannah. That was the answer to her prayer. Samuel became a very famous prophet. Uh, So the author is telling this story about Samuel's mum. It's quite a long passage, so I'm just going to kind of summarize it, but do have it open in front of you because we'll be dipping in to uh, the words that the author uses in this book. So Hannah is in deep anguish. She is crying, weeping bitterly. She's praying to the Lord, I want to have a baby. I want to have a baby. I want to have a baby. And I haven't had a baby. Hannah is in deep anguish. She's crying bitterly. She's praying. She's lamenting. And she makes this vow in verse 11. This is her prayer. Verse 11 is the prayer that she prays. She says, Lord Almighty, if you will look down upon my misery and you'll answer my prayer and you'll give me a son, then I will give him back to you. And he will be yours for his entire lifetime. And she did. 
And that boy grew up to be the Samuel of First Samuel. This is the prophet who commissioned the first king of Israel, King Saul, and commissioned King David in first and second book of Samuel. You can read about it. Samuel is Hannah's son. This is a key pivotal moment in the history of salvation. Hannah, when times are hard, pray. And in these verses, uh, I'm going to talk about six things that we can do when it feels hopeless. You know, I hope this weekend you're not feeling hopeless. I really do. I hope you're not feeling hopeless. And, and in that sense, uh, maybe you're not feeling hopeless this weekend. And so, but maybe you're going to need this someday. So I'm going to encourage you to take some notes Because there will be times in your life when you are going to lose loved ones. You're going to have failures. You're going to have times in your life that are hard. Harder than anything you can think or dream or imagine of at this point in your life. Where it feels hopeless. But you are going to know what to do. The Bible tells us what to do when times are hard. So number one. Number one, let's get straight into it. The first uh, slide here, look up to God. When times are hard, you look up to God. In verse nine, you see there, she stood up. She got up from her misery, from her deep anguish. She got up and she looked to God. She got up and went to prayer. I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna look to God. Now, a lot of people say, God plans out everything in our lives. What's the point of praying? Why in the world should we pray? It's a good question. If God is planning everything out, God's in charge, God's in control, why should we even pray? And here's the reason why. God in his sovereignty and his wisdom wants to involve us in his plan. And so part of his plan is to use our prayers to accomplish what he intends to do. Mind-blowing. This is God inviting us to be his partners. You know, God can do everything in the world without a single prayer. He doesn't need our prayers. But God has chosen to involve you in your life and me in my own life and all of us in the direction of the world. And they see there's something God only does if we pray. God is waiting for you to pray. There are some kind of problems in life that are never going to be solved until you look up and pray to God. God is waiting for you to pray. So this is a starting point. It's kind of obvious in the series about praying. First thing to do, pray. But she does it right. She stands up, she gets up, and she prays. God's waiting for you to pray. Now here's the second thing you do. This is what Hannah did. God wants you to do this too when times are hard. Secondly, Pray passionately. Pray passionately. I'm talking about praying with emotion. Verse 10, we see this second thing. She's praying passionately. Hannah is weeping. She's weeping. When was the last time you wept when you prayed? That's passionate. God says, when you talk to me, I want to hear your heart. James, are you saying it's okay to complain to God? Of course it is. Of course it is. It's okay to complain to God. God, I don't like this. God, this is terrible. God, this isn't right. God, this isn't fair. Now, there's a word for this crying out to God in the Bible. It's the word called lamenting. Lamenting is a crying out to God. It's called a lament. A lament is just another word for a complaint. Did you know that in the Bible, the book of Psalms, you've got there 150 Psalms. 
But not all of them are sunshiny, happy clappy, the sun will come out tomorrow kind of songs. A third of the Psalms in the Bible, a third of them, 50, are complaints, are laments. So yes, it's okay for you to complain to God. There are other uh, best books in the Bible about lamenting. For example, some of you might have heard of the book of Job. There's also the book of lamentations. There is a whole book in the Bible full of complaints. Yes, written by the complaining prophet, Jeremiah. God cares about your laments. It's okay for you to complain to God. God cares about the pain. In fact, you know, he would far rather have you complain than for you to say some little polite prayer that you don't really care about. He wants to know what's on your heart. You know, Hannah is not praying a polite request here, if at all possible. Please, pretty please. She's praying a gut-wrenching prayer. So if you don't get anything else, I tell you, I want you to get this. It doesn't matter where you pray. A lot of people think they have to go into a church building to pray, which is okay. But God doesn't care where you pray. What matters is expressing your heart when you're praying. Okay, all right, here's the third thing you do when times are hard and you're feeling hopeless. Maybe you're gonna need this someday. So again, keep writing these things down. The third thing you need to do is identify the cause of my hopelessness. Identify the cause of my hopelessness. I don't know about you. Have you ever had a general, vague feeling of uneasiness? You know, you're feeling down, you're feeling um, a bit off, and you're like, I don't know why I feel this way. I don't know why. Well, you can't work on it until you name it. When you name the feeling, that in itself helps you get a handle on it. Anything you can't name is already out of control in your life. So if you've got this vague feeling of depression or a vague feeling of feeling down or discouraged, you need to stop and ask, what's really going on here? What's behind this? You need to pinpoint the source. And this is what Hannah did. You know, yes, She didn't have a baby, but there was lots else going on in her life. You can read from the passage, there's like another woman uh, in those days. There's another wife. There's a whole bunch of other issues as well knocking around in our life. And she had to identify the cause of her hopelessness. You see, hopelessness isn't the problem. The problem is what's causing the feelings of hopelessness. You know, and as we read this, um, this vivid description of Hannah's story, of what's going through Hannah's mind as she's heartbroken and she's praying this prayer, we see this illustrates several common causes of hopelessness. So for your benefit, I just want to uh, point them out. Uh, I'm grateful to Rick Warren who did some work in this, summarizing these common causes from scripture. I want to pick out these causes of hopelessness because then you'll know this is what is really making me feel bad. It's not this vague sense of hopelessness. Yeah. You can't work in it until you name it. So in this passage, we see five common causes of hopelessness. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to tick any one of these that you may be feeling right now, because this could be a precursor to depression or hopelessness in your life. Okay, so here are five feelings that cause us to feel hopeless. Number one, feeling overwhelmed. You know, Hannah was feeling so overwhelmed to the point of not eating. That's pretty overwhelmed. Number one, you're just feeling overwhelmed. Number two, feeling, I've hit rock bottom. She was in deep anguish, deeply 
distressed. She was heartbroken. She's broken. I feel broken. I'm at rock bottom. That's going to cause feelings of hopelessness. Again, maybe you can use this checklist with friends when you're helping them try to figure out what's making them feel so bad. A third big cause of hopelessness is feeling pain and anguish. Chronic pain. Hannah is in severe mental pain. Did you know that the word worry, the English word worry, comes from the old English word, worgen? Do you know what that word means? To choke. To strangle. Worry has a strangling, choking feeling on your life. Anxiety about pain can choke the hope out of you. Fourthly, Hannah's also feeling trapped and powerless. She wept bitterly. You know, bitterness is that anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. She was resenting. You feel trapped by forces outside of your control. She's also feeling rejected and lonely. Uh, She begins a prayer, if only you would look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget. You know, uh, loneliness Rejection can cause you to feel hopeless. The author says that Hannah feels like God is a million, million miles away. So as we've gone through that list, are you feeling any of those right now? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Are you feeling broken at rock bottom? Are you feeling anguish and pain? Are you feeling trapped and powerless? Are you feeling rejected or lonely? Okay, well, let's go to the next step then. Here's number four. Ask God for specific help. Only when you name what you're feeling, only when you identify what you're feeling, can you actually pray about it specifically. So once I've named what I'm really feeling, I can bring it specifically before God. You know, I've just had this vague feeling of feeling bad, but now I know what's causing it, then I begin to pray specifically. Now here's the key to asking for specific help. Again, might be helpful to write this down. Pray the word of God. Pray the word of God. Pray the word of God. What do I mean by that? I mean, take scripture and say them back to God. This is what Hannah did to get her miracle. Hannah is clearly well-versed in the scriptures because in this very short prayer in verse 11, she refers to the scriptures she knew. Now, it's a whole lot better to pray the Bible back to God. God loves to hear his words prayed back to him. You say, well, what should I pray, James? You know, which bits of the Bible are you talking about? Well, number one, here we go. First one, you should pray the complaints to God. Pray the complaints of the Bible to God. Everything Hannah just prayed is actually from Scripture. For example, Genesis 30, verse 22, it says, Then God remembered Rachel, and she gave birth to Joseph. Hannah is praying the complaints of the patriarchs, the matriarchs, the people who grappled with not having children in the Bible. She's praying the complaints of Abram and Sarah, the complaints of Isaac and Rebekah, the complaints of Jacob and Rachel. You pray the complaints. So when you read one of those lamentation verses or chapters or songs in Psalms, you go, this is my prayer too. And you pray, God, this is not fair. It says so here in the Bible. God, this is not fair. You pray the complaints. As I said, they're in Job, they're in Psalms, they're in Lamentations. First thing, you pray the complaints to God. Second thing, you pray the truth about God. That's the second thing. First, you pray the complaints. Now you pray the truth about God. God, you're a gracious God. God, you're a compassionate God. God, you're slow to anger and abounding in love. God, you're a just God. God, you're a fair God. 
You pray what the Bible says about God back to God. Okay, God, here's my complaints from the Bible, and here's what people say about you in the Bible. And then the third thing, you pray the promises of God. You pray the promises of God. God, you promised to do this, now keep your word. I can't tell you how many times in my prayers I've said, God, I need you to keep your word. I need you to do what you promised to do in your word. You've promised right here, and I'll say the promise as I've got it memorized. You have promised to do this, God. I need you to keep your word. Hannah asked God to remember her, to not forget. You know, when everything looks dark, when I can't see ahead, there's a fog there and our lives are shrouded. I can't see the future, it's pitch black. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. I focus on the promises of God to me. And what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to mentally shift my line, my mind. When I'm hopeless, I'm going to have to choose to stop thinking about the things that are making me feel hopeless and I'm gonna to have to change the channel of my mind and start thinking about the things that I can be. When I do that, I know for sure it's gonna lift my spirit, the goodness of God, how he's been good to me in the past, how he's promised to be good to me in the future. Pray the truth, pray the promises, and then you pray about following the way of God. Hannah made a vow. She chose to follow the way of God. She follows the example of Jacob, the great patriarch in scripture. Jacob had this dream of a stairway to heaven. He saw things from God's point of view. And when he woke up, he made a vow to follow God. Hannah made a vow to give her precious, prized son to the Lord. Make a vow to look at life from God's point of view instead of our own viewpoints. Make a vow to follow the way of God and not to focus on the problems in my life. And when you feel hopeless, you need to change the channel of your mind. You need to change the focus of your viewpoint. You know, if you look at the world, you'll be de-stressed. If you look within, you're probably going to be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Let me say that again. If you look at the world, you'll be de-stressed. If you look within, you'll probably be depressed. If you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. It all depends on what you're looking at. It all depends on what you're focused on. You change the channel. The world talks about well-being, and that's truth. It's truth. But Scripture goes further and talks about dwell-being. Dwelling in Christ. Your well-being comes from resting. Resting in Christ. Dwelling in Christ. Changing the channel of your mind. Let's talk about dwell-being. Hannah knew the scriptures so well that when she's in deep anguish, weeping bitterly, she could quote scripture from memory and she's quoting the goodness of God and is quoting the complaints of Sarah, Rebecca and Rachel and so Hannah refocuses her mind by making a vow to follow the way of God. Can you do that? God's way of getting out of hopelessness. You need to start thinking about God's word instead of thinking about your worries. If you're thinking about your worries, it's just gonna be swirling down into hopelessness. If you're thinking about God's word, it's gonna be look up and pray when you hit hard times. Okay, another two lessons we learn from Hannah's examples are when times are hard. Uh, Fifthly, reject false fixes. Reject false 
fixes and accept God's grace. I don't know about you, um, we've all seen people in big trouble who turn to God only as their last resort. They try literally everything else to solve their problem before they finally, in humility, turn to God. And they will try some of the stupidest, foolish, most worthless things instead of God when they're in deep trouble. Their marriage is falling apart. Their career is falling apart. Their body may be falling apart. Their reputation is falling apart. And they're looking to everything else. You know, verse 12, it's, it's no surprise Eli thinks Hannah is drunk. Because that's how people respond when times are hard. They get a skimful. Numbing the pain we feel with alcohol, drugs, relationships, food, adrenaline. These are all false fixes. We all know people who've looked to other things to deal with their unsolvable problem instead of turning to the grace of God. You know, when I thought of it like this, I thought of this verse here on the screen. Romans 12 verse 5. Instead of believing the truth about God, many people choose to believe lies. They choose to believe lies. You know, one of the reasons you get so tired and stressed out when times are hard is because there's an unseen spiritual battle or war going on in your life every single moment. Times are hard because there's a sinister and evil power, and his name is Satan, and he wants you to feel hopeless when times are hard. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. But here's the thing, Satan can only twist. Satan can only destroy. But as your church leader, I need you to understand this. Satan is not as powerful as God. This is not about good and bad, yin and yang. Satan is not as powerful as God. For one thing, Satan can't create anything. He can't create. Satan can only distort Satan can only lie. He can lie about the beautiful things of God. And of course, we see that happening everywhere, don't we? He lies about money. He lies about sex. He lies about physical beauty. He lies about power. And Satan uses a number of lies to confuse you. Here's a lie up on the screen. This is too much for me. It's a lie. Satan, you see, uses hurt and pain and trauma. If Satan could get you bitter or ashamed about something that's happened to you or through you or by you, then he's going to distort the truth. And when you say you're no good, you're worthless, you'll never amount to anything, you're a failure, and Satan uses the things you tell yourself, he uses the lies you tell yourself over and over again. Satan uses other people's opinions. I hate to say this, but um, people lie to you all the time. And some of the things that they've been, been said to you or about you by peers, by parents, by partners, by enemies, by friends, they just aren't true. Here's another lie. If it feels right, it must be right. It's a lie. It may feel right to you, but that doesn't make it right. It's just not true. Your feelings are a terrible predictor of truth. Think about it. They're often totally out of line. Uh, I mean, we know from studies that doctors can give you a medicine or can stimulate your brain and make you feel things that are totally untrue. So Satan can use your feelings against you. Feelings, don't rely on them. Here's another one. I got this. I am the master of my fate. It's a lie. It's the lie of self-sufficiency. You are not the master of your fate. This is easily disprovable. It's easily proven wrong. Think about it. You didn't choose most of the major things that made you. You didn't choose where you were born. You didn't choose who your parents were. You didn't choose your race. You didn't choose your natural gifts. You're not the master of your fate. When we say this lie, we're trying to say God is not God and that you are God. 
It's a lie. You haven't got this. You're not the master of your faith. And this last one. God helps those who help themselves. It's a lie. It's just not true. It's not in the Bible. God helps those who trust him, not who help themselves. People choose to believe lies and they forfeit the grace of God. Look at the screen. I love this verse. Philippians 3 verse 3. We put no confidence in human effort. Instead, we boast about what Christ has done already for us. You know, studies have shown that how you feel about yourself is largely determined by what you think the people that matter most to you think about you. Let me say that again. Studies have shown that how you feel about yourself is largely determined by what you think the people that matter most to you think about you. Now, since that's true, I highly recommend that you make Jesus Christ the most important person in your life. Care more about what he says about you than anybody else. It's not your human efforts that are going to free you. Christ alone can set you free, not your human efforts. It's not by pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. We depend on the grace of God. That's what Hannah did. Hannah didn't try to free herself. She's not trying to free herself. She poured out her soul to the Lord. She prayed out of great anguish and grief and made a vow to trust God and reject false fixes. Here's that, the sixth and final thing you do when life seems helpless. Express gratitude to God in advance. Express gratitude to God in advance. Before you're out of the situation, while you're in deep anguish. Now look, I need to explain the difference between gratitude before and gratitude after. If I wait until after God solves my problem to thank him, that's gratitude. I'm thankful, right? And that's good. But if I thank God in advance before the problem, that's faith. And God always, always responds to faith. How do I show gratitude to God in advance? Well, there are two ways. Hannah did two things. You see this, verse 19. Hannah arose and worshipped before the Lord. She did this before she had the answer. Two things, really quickly. First thing, through singing. Yes, singing. We know that worshipping the Lord involves singing because in chapter 2 we see Hannah's famous song in the Bible. Now some of you, maybe, don't think singing is important in worship. It is. Don't have time to go into it now, but there's just one thing I will say to you in this, is that psychological studies have shown that singing is good for your health. It's a depression reliever. It doesn't matter about your voice. The Bible says make a joyful noise. So singing is important. Don't just sing on a Sunday. Sing in your daily lives. Look up. Look up. Sing. Express your gratitude to God in advance. Second thing. Second through is giving back to God, through giving back to God. We can express gratitude to God in advance by giving back to God. We know that worshiping the Lord involved sacrifice. When Hannah gives back to God, she might be thinking of Jacob, making that vow at the stairway of heaven. He vowed, of all that you will give me, I will give you a tenth. Do you give any of your income that is God's back to him? that is given to you by God, back to him, in recognition it all came from him in the first place? That's a sacrifice. In advance, before I get my answer to prayer, before I get my miracle, I'm going to give an offering in faith. I'm going to give back to God. I'm going to sacrifice money back to God to express my gratitude. There are people here listening right now who are feeling hopeless. There are some people here feeling overwhelmed and they know it. They've hit rock bottom. There are some here who feel powerless to change anything. Many who are listening right now online, maybe you're feeling lonely and rejected. There are others that are feeling in deep misery 
And I'm sure a lot of people feel trapped. Trapped in a job. Trapped in a relationship they can't get on with, can't get out of. Trapped in a habit. Trapped in a memory. Let's bow our heads right now. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Lord, Lord Almighty, help them to do what Hannah did, to follow her example and take these steps. Help them to pray with passion, not fake memorized prayers. Help them to pray your word back to you, the complaints, the truths, the promises. Uh, I, I want you to pray this prayer. Just say what I say in your mind back to God. Lord Almighty, I'm feeling a little helpless or hopeless, so I'm looking to you. I want to look up and turn my thoughts to you. I want to focus on your goodness, not my problems. You love me. Say that in your heart, friends. You love me. You really love me. You will never stop loving me. You have always loved me. Help me never forget that or doubt that, even when times are hard. Thank you, Jesus Christ, that you died on the cross for me so I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you rose from the dead on the third day and that you appeared in person to your followers. Thank you that before you returned to heaven, you promised your Holy Spirit to be with me daily and forever. Holy Spirit, come in and do some supernatural house cleaning in my heart. Change my values. Change my priorities. Lord Almighty, I want to reject all the fake and false fixes. I want to depend on your grace. Regardless of how I'm feeling right now, I'm going to thank you in advance for rescuing me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Everlasting, ever strong. God, your love goes on. Never see